and um, we'll proceed. Let's begin uh, with a blessing. Baruch Atad and I, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Ki Deshanam B'Mitzvah Tav, B'Tzivano Lasok Pedivre Torah. Blessed to you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. All right. Now, today, man, I had such great designs to do four chapters today. Uh, you know, as it, as it turned out, I got looking and I looked and saw how many words I got on this thing. Um, and I'm going to have to start talking very fast because I got 5,160, 5,165 words in my notes. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot of words. All right. So here we are. Let's go jump right into it. And, uh, here we, we're in, in this part here where they're still talking about judgment against, uh, Judah's neighbors and, uh, these important dates, we we kind of jumped back up in this time frame right around here between 735 and 732 um time frame and uh um so as a result i have moved our little cursor here this one here i moved it back uh to uh, to where this this particular oracle was written and uh, that just it's it seemed that in terms of of timing it's a little bit out of place so i mean we've kind of jumped back uh 10 15 years that where isaiah had written this and then just held on to it until the timing was right and uh, so that's where we are right now and we are going to be doing these two um, chapters here, 17 and 18, uh, Damascus and Ephraim. Ephraim being another, uh, just another word or another uh, um, description of the northern tribes. That's what they're talking about, the northern tribes. Samaria being the capital of the northern tribes. And so that's where we are. All right. Whoops. And so tonight, the areas that we're going to be talking about are going to be up here, Damascus, the the kingdom of Aram Damascus, or, you know, today we call it Syria. Part of it is uh, Syria. But this is where we're going to be talking about here. And then this area of Israel. Now, the uh, this is, well, right in here, too. Uh, this area here is probably somewhere uh, these borders are approximate but i think they're they're close to around 735 740 uh, bce and there there hadn't been a whole lot of change in those borders in quite a few years a little bit of incursion here and back and forth but for the most part that's what it was going to be okay so um remember that last uh, last week we talked about the the oracle against philistia and moab and so now isaiah turns to the two neighbors to the north because remember philistia and, and uh, moab were to the south he got Phil the philistine kingdom here and then moab over here and so um now we're going to be looking at uh, Damascus and northern northern Israel, they uh, the combined treatment of these two, uh, it's suggesting that this prophecy was actually written earlier than the than the uh, the one last week, because it would have been speaking of the uh, Syro Ephraimite alliance that was from 735 to 732 there was about a three-year period where uh, uh israel had allied themselves with damascus in an effort to subdue or to get the king of judah to uh also ally with them to or join up with them so that they could fight the assyrians they were trying to get the, build these alliances and get big enough and strong enough that they could 
fight against the Assyrians. And so um, we don't know why it was it was put into this space here, um, but uh, it again kind of falls into the category of um, of uh, just Isaiah trying to get Judah and Israel to rely on God and not rely on their their neighbors and alliances with their neighbors because that just would not work very well. And it did not work. God wanted him, the nation to rely on him and not on the uh, the other nations around them. So, uh, and it also kind of shows here again that no matter what all is going on all around Israel and Judah, God is still in control of all of this and the, the nations can rage all they want to, but God is still in control. So that's kind of a comfort even to us today when we see some of the foolishness that's going around. Remember, God is in control. We may not see it all. We may not understand it all. We may not like it all that's, uh, that's going on, but God is still in control. All right, let's 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 go ahead with uh, the scriptures then. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease as a city and will become a ruinous heap. The cities of Aror, Aror are, for stake, are forsaken. They will be for flocks. They will lie down and no one will frighten them. The fortress will also cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. The remnant of Aram will be like the glory of B'nai Israel. It is a declaration of Adonai Svaot. Damascus was one of the most strategic cities in the ancient world because it stood right at the mouth of a, of a natural funnel between mountain mountain ranges where the only convenient land route between Mesopotamia and Egypt was right through uh, Damascus. And so um, as a result of that, you know, that made Damascus a very powerful and a very wealthy city because they could tax the merchants coming back and forth between the two. And uh, um it's a very, very important city of its time, much, much more influenced than the the size of the city would uh, would indicate. And so God here through Isaiah is declaring the destruction of this uh, this great city. And so um, by the time that these prophecies, you know, the, the prophecies against Philistia and Moab, he that um, the destruction of, of Damascus and so forth, and, and the destruction of Damascus had already occurred because remember the, uh, the, the prophecies against Philistia and Moab were, were uh, closer down toward uh, seven, 705, some, sometime in that time frame. But this, we know that uh, Damascus fell in uh, 732 BCE, and then 10 years later, uh, Samaria was defeated and and it fell. So, um, you know, basically, it's just like a human history. For every influential power, there's always a greater one that can reduce it to desolation. I mean, it just you think you're the biggest and the baddest for a while. Well, then guess what? You get defeated. You know, the biggest and baddest for a long time was Rome for a thousand years, almost. And yet they they were defe eventually defeated. And what do we have left of the Roman Empire? Pizza. And so um, here the uh, it says that the uh, that Ephraim and Syria together, you know, they allied together. They're going to fall together, and that they would become just basically a, a grazing ground for for sheep. So they're going to be just turned into pasture instead of a thriving city. And uh, But Isaiah said, there is still going to be a remnant in Aram, in, in the uh, 
the country of Iran, which is Syria today, and that uh, there will be there will be a a, a a remnant, and just like Israel, there will be a remnant, and so God is going to keep some people in those in those countries. It's not going to be totally wiped out. Verse four. Now in that day, Jacob's glory will fade and the fatness of his flesh grow lean. It will be as when the harvester gathers the standing grain and reaps the heads with his arm. And uh, as when one gleans grain in the valley of Rephi, uh, Rephaim, uh, um, only gleanings will remain as when beating an olive tree, two or three olives at the very top, four or five on a fruitful tree's branches. It is a declaration of Adonai, God of Israel. Okay, so um, the concept of glory in Hebrew carries with it a, the connotations of, of permanence, abundance, significance, and, and reality. The glory of Jacob, as shared by Assyria, will be none of these, okay? That, that God is going to expose the... Um, He's going to expose the world to the glory of Israel, and uh, you know she's, and I use the glory in in quotation marks. And she's achieved these through her own strength, and that it's nothing but a fraud. It's an empty, hollow shell because why they're not relying on God. And so, um, let me change my move my page forward. Um, and it, so it, it it portrays Israel as kind of a, a a man who is maybe starving or just getting old and getting so old and ancient that where he was at one point muscular and strong and buff, well now he's just a skinny old man with uh, with skinny arms where the the flesh is just hanging off of them and. Uh, um the the wealth is gone the riches are gone the the uh power is gone and so the reputation is is gone so it's uh, the uh, <laughs> uh um dr oswald who i'm using one of his books uh, on this he he uh, compared it to an image of uh, adolf eichmann who was a uh who is largely responsible for the the um, Holocaust and the and the final solution? He compares the picture of him at the beginning, you know, when he was at his peak power in the uh, in World War II, with later on when he had been captured, and he's on trial. And so, um, uh, let me show you that picture there. You've seen that. Now, you know, here he was, you know. Uh, the uh, the consummate Aryan in uh, the World War II, member of the SS, and uh, then here he is and is um, um, at his trial, and he's got headphones on so that they can translate for him. But but uh, he looks actually pretty good there. Later pictures of him from the time that he was sentenced until the they uh, uh, until he was hanged. Um, he showed a, a defeated old man. And so then I thought I'd show you a picture where it talks about the, the, uh, reaping the, the grain from the Valley of Rephaim. Um, and that's a, it's a nice green area. This is just one picture of it that I had. All right. So <clears throat> the, uh, the prophet uses the three figures of speech that uh, let me let me get back to that that um had, to describe what will remain of of uh, israel and syria and there's you know first a physical that's the old man the old uh, wasted guy and then two agricultural ones and um the uh, this lush valley of uh, refine that's uh, southwest of Jerusalem. It's, uh, you know, it's been cut. All of the grain has been cut. It's all gone. It's all the, the reapers have come through the, the ones that um, can come through and the, the poor people can, 
gather gleaners. The gleaners can come through. There's nothing left. And then the olive trees, you know, on, on olive trees, uh, what they do with them, they wait until they're, you know, almost pretty, everything is ripe. They spread um, cloth underneath the big tarps underneath the, the olive tree. And then they have, actually today, they have machines that will come and grab a hold of the trunk of the olive tree. And it kind of goes, it, it shakes it a little bit um and the olives fall and so now it's just saying that uh, and not all of the olives will fall some will stay on there and so that's the description it's saying that well there will still be a few olives left that's the remnant they're way up there on the on the top of the tree where you really can't get up there and get it or out on a limb where you really can't get up there and get it either so all right so uh Let's go ahead. To, and any comments or questions on this so far? All right. Verse seven. In that day, a man will look to his maker and his eyes will turn to the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, nor will he look to what his fingers have made, neither the Asherah poles nor the sun images. All right. Now, um, this is kind of a, a coming to terms with God is exactly what the prophet foresees as uh, as a result of the coming destru uh, destruction that, you know, they're, they're destroyed. And at that point, they're going to uh, um, turn, turn back to God, the God that they had forgotten. And so uh, this repentance, of course, is not going to uh, halt the destruction because actually the repentance came after the destruction, but it will show them the fallacy of the course that they've been walking on that how, uh, how ridiculous it was to rely on nations and not rely on God. And so now almost all of uh, the Modern commentators have argued that verses seven and eight here that we just read are misplaced uh, because they uh, uh, seem to kind of interrupt the flow that goes from uh, verse nine, uh, six to nine, but uh, uh, also that they say, well, the language and the theology of it is is more like uh, post um, post exile, you know, after they've been defeated and they're in the exile and and um the, the idea that god you know that he says the maker meaning the creator of the world another reference to god that uh, uh one commentator says well that's a a much later concept that uh, comes up um maybe in toward the end of of uh, isaiah and uh, chapter 51 and chapter 54 maybe but uh um you know other other uh contemporary prophets also use that same language as the maker hosea in um uh, 8 hosea 814 talks about the maker and, and of course he was he was not post exilic or, or post exile he was before the exile so anyway these these um destructions will indeed in reality they will turn israel back to god and i've i've mentioned it so often that uh, that israel as a result of the exile and as a result of you know basically getting slapped in the face with uh, all of their own sins and their failings and faults and so forth they um, did a lot of introspection and they had some good leadership in the uh, exile, exiled people. You know, you had guys like uh, Daniel with his three buddies, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and, and several others uh, that were very strong, godly men. And they then were able to um, kind of redirect Israel into another path. And, and after the exile, Israel never, ever again had problems with idolatry. 
other nations still followed idolatry for you know a thousand years later but uh, uh but not israel they uh, uh they abstained from any kind of a, uh idolatry from the from the exile forward and so yeah they did learn their lesson and uh uh it was it was uh, a, a lesson a hard learned lesson so anyway um it talks about the the um the gods that these guys would make and how israel would turn away from the gods and that they were handmade well you know that's for us today we look at it and say uh well how could they worship something that's you know they created on their own and uh yet we see people today that almost worship the ground that uh um some of these hollywood uh, actors are on or or sports figures you know they call them sports heroes they're not heroes okay they are guys that can kick a football or throw a baseball and nothing more than that they can do it better than some other folks but they're certainly not heroic but people just really think that that's the great the grandest thing in the in the world to have an autograph from you know whatever a, a ball player well when i was eight years old so did i but uh uh you know i'd go to the white Sox games up in chicago and try to get the autographs of all of the players and i got a i got quite a few of them in my in my years up there but uh what where what are they worth nothing and uh and so because i'm not you know at that point let's just say that the chicago teams were not the best in the world all right so um in other words there was no roger maris or mickey mantles in my autograph group uh so um and they talk about the asherahs now here's an asherah and now how anyone could actually worship that goofy looking creature i don't know but uh and you know asherah they start talk about sun images other translations in the of this this verse they instead of sun images there they they call it uh, incense altars and uh so it's the the hebrew there is not particularly clear and it could it could be you know either way but uh, and then here's another um uh, relief picture of uh, of asherah she was uh, you know a goddess of fertility and and so forth so uh but basically isaiah said you know in the in, in the future you're going to get to a point where you recognize that these are not gods they're nothing but carvings that you make yourself and that they uh will do you no good whatsoever so um comments questions Isaiah 17 9 says in that day the strong cities will be like forsaken forests and treetops that were abandoned because of B'nai Israel they will be laid waste for you have forgotten the the God of your salvation and you have not remembered the rock of your strength therefore you plant delightful plants and set out exotic vines in the day that you were uh, that you plant you fence it in in the morning you made your seed to sprout but the afternoon but the harvest will be a heap in a day of grief and incurable pain okay so there's a lot of imagery here and israel had they developed some customs that the, the that the pagans did that they would go and plant trees in certain sequences and certain patterns and so forth and uh, and then as they grew up that would become a a sacred place for that particular uh little g god and so that that's what they're talking about there that uh, you know all these planting of of these uh, forests or these trees and so forth that um, that was going to they're going to be cut down there's not going to be anything left there and so um this verse nine here if you look at it 
it's addressed to the reader, you know, the people that uh, that um, Isaiah was talking to, uh, and it treats Israel in the third person. Okay, it's not. It's like they're talking to the the exiles or the the people, not the exiles at this point. No, the but uh, they're talking to the people of Judah, residents of Judah, and and, and Israel as kind of third persons. So if you can get the the general gist of that, whereas then you get into the verses ten and eleven, and it goes back to the second person. It says. Uh, you know, that uh, uh, these treetops and forests were abandoned because of B'nai Israel, they will be laid to waste. But then chapter, uh, in verse 10, it goes right back and says, for you have forgotten the God of your salvation and you have not remembered the rock of your strength. So uh, Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen. And this is why, because you've forgotten God. We have that same kind of language later on in the, the Bible, well, in fact, the last book, where um, Yeshua told one of the, of the seven churches that you have forgotten your first love. And so uh, um, that, that kind of language of forgetting God and that con concept of forgetting God uh, did not die out with the exile or did not die out with Isaiah. So um, they says uh, they talk about they planted exotic plants, and there again that was a that was a um, pagan thing that they would plant these different things that really were not native to their area in an effort to to uh, have something different that they could grow and and it would be. Um, uh, you know, part of their their worship actually was, and uh, you know the it talks about the the vines or the roots going out, and so again that uh, referring to the idea of getting away from God, getting to these these uh, pagan little g gods, and <clears throat> that kind of leads them astray, kind of like planting bamboo. That is uh, the kind of bamboo. It's not a clumping bamboo. It's a running bamboo where you plant it, and the next thing you know, your uh, your yard is full of bamboo, and you can't get rid of it. It's just uh, it's uh, that's that's what it, it's like when you go after false gods, and they uh, it it just takes over your your life. Um, and as a master gardener. Uh, um, uh, hint, do not plant mint in the ground. Put it in a pot. Otherwise, it'll it'll take over your entire flower bed. Um, so at the end of it, the, those verses, though, it talks about, well, you can do all of that stuff. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, no amount of green thumb is going to produce a crop that is worth anything because why you've made your reliance on something other than the one true God. That's the theme that Isaiah is trying to do over and over and over again to, to tell the people that you have to stay with God and to worship him and not any of these other things to the other people. So, um, the um yeah there's a lot of lot of stuff in there that I, i'm just gonna <laughs> kind of skip over because there's there's just a, a a whole bunch of things you know when they talk about the um, um some of these these things that uh you could just say it a, a, a ton different different ways that uh how that they had forgotten god forsaken his ways chased after the the um um chased after the the false gods the, the one of the things with the adonis cult is they took potted plants and they were force bloomed like you know making them uh root bound or something like that and then they're allowed to die then they won't water them they just die off why because that's a symbolic of the fertility cycle of the world now that was a greek version but the uh, the worship of Tammuz 
in the in the Babylonian culture was uh, was very uh, uh, very much like that, and that that is mentioned in the Bible itself in uh, Ezekiel when we when we went through Ezekiel, you remember that was in uh, like chapter eight or something like that, and so uh, it was practiced widely within the the ancient uh, Middle East of the the Tammuz worship of the the idea of the the fertility and then the dies you know just they would worship nature where then they'd have the fertility and then the productivity and then you died and then it'd start all over again and so um um so we don't we don't know if this is specifically um uh, um tied to israel but uh you know they were they were into everything else that the pagans did so i see no reason why they wouldn't have been doing that too all right look at uh verse verse 12 here oi or woe uh the the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roarings of the seas the rumblings of nations who rush in like the rumbling of mighty waters the nations will rush in like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them, he being God, so that they will flee far away, chased like chaff on the uh, hills before the wind, like whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, sudden terror before morning, they are no more. This is the reward of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. So the um, the upcoming the the these almost imminent hordes of the enemy uh, will be like the noise of a roaring surf, and uh, those of you that uh, live by the sea or gone to the oceans, and uh, um, you can understand what the roar of the surf can be, especially if you're in an area. In the Gulf of Mexico, we don't have that very much uh, of it, but you go to places like um, on the Pacific Coast, East East Coast, uh, or the West Coast, where you get that long expanse of waves, and they come crashing down onto the onto the uh, seashore, and it's a roar. It and you can hear it a long a long ways away before you actually get to the uh, to the beach. Um, so, um, I'm going ahead. Um, so with the, uh, the roar of, I mean, these, these, um, uh, hordes of enemies coming into Israel, it's like, uh, just the, the roar of the ocean coming up against, uh, against everyone. So, um, and so what can Israel do? You know, they, uh, if you ever been to the beach, you hear, you know, the, the waves will come crashing in and you, you know, can't stop the waves, you know, I, uh, it, it'd be silly to try that. In fact, uh, um, you know, I can remember as a young boy, uh, down in, in Brownsville and when the waves would come in and we'd stand out there and, and, we take our fists and pound them up into the wave and say, we're going to stop the waves coming. And of course we didn't. It, it's the silliness of, of, uh, of little boys. And that's what uh, Isaiah is trying to tell Israel here and, and Judah that this is coming. You're not going to stop it. It's, uh, it's just going to happen. So just be, be aware. But he also says that, um, God is going to rebuke these conquering hordes. And so like I couldn't stop the waves of the ocean coming in with my fist, um, God can, and he did. And so they um, uh, they saw where these, these Assyrians, even though they were fierce, that empire did not last very long. Then the Babylonians came through that empire didn't last particularly long either. And so um, it's the imagery here is the, the, the wind coming in and the waves and, 
blowing chaff away from their their winnowing process you know and and once the the chaff is blown away you know that's it just dissipates it's gone you can't really go and find it and so uh they talk about these nations just like almost overnight being destroyed and that's what god is saying well they're, they're going to serve their purpose I'm going to they're going to do what i allow them to do and then they will be destroyed and so um you know we look at it uh, today and say well you know really how could that actually happen like that but those of you who study history remember that uh in the spring of 1942 get back to it's world war ii germany and japan between the two of them ruled almost half of the globe territorial wise and maybe even more when you consider that japan controlled china and so uh but the spring of 1942, say April, May 42, well, guess what? Three years later, in May of 1945, Germany was defeated. They were gone. Three months later than that, Japan was defeated with the dropping of uh, the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima that uh, Japan was totally defeated. So those empires, those great juggernauts of, of war were destroyed within three years. So that thousand year Reich uh, didn't last but four or five, six years. And that was it. And so that's what God was was saying here through through Isaiah, that these things would be, come through but then they were going to be destroyed. And so um, some of the imagery here that uh, that they're talking about where God rebukes the, uh, the, the conquering hordes, it's, it kind of draws on um, some of the Middle Eastern legends and myth about how that the, you know, these guys were not, a lot of them were not seafarers. And so they looked at the Mediterranean Sea as uh, chaos and chaotic and that uh, there was there be dragons out there. And so they he used that same kind of uh, imagery here. Not that he uh, uh, believed in or espoused the, the, the ancient mythology, but it was something that people would understand and um, they would they would know what he's talking about in that in that regard. So, um, in verse uh, fourteen, there in that in that series, uh, it uh, ends this con uh, contra uh, contrast uh, that was in you know, chapters twelve and thirteen, and so very very short, succinct, terse actually statements. He shows that it's not Israel's fate which is at stake. In fact, it's the attackers who will be destroyed between night and morning. And so um, I think that you could look at the comparison there. Well, how could a, an army be destroyed in one night? Uh, you just need to go back to the story of uh, when Sennacherib was surrounding Jerusalem. And they were struck with a plague overnight, 185,000 soldiers died. And so that was, that was pretty catastrophic right there. They, uh, Sennacherib had to, uh, had to uh, flee or he went back to, to um, Nineveh. I think that was uh, the, his capital and um where uh, we went back in defeat and then he i believe he was uh, he was assassinated but he did not come to a good end all right so any comments or questions before we go into chapter 18 all right so verse uh, 1 of chapter 18 oi again that woe 
uh, the land of whirling wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia that sends ambassadors by sea and papyrus vessels upon the water. Go, swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, a nation powerful and oppressive, whose land the rivers divide. All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, look. When a shofar is blown, listen. All right, so um, it's talking about the land, which is it's beyond the rivers of, of Ethiopia. Well, the language there is a little confusing because, um, you know, we call it Kush. And this area down here, the Kush being... Uh, or you'd say it would be up river, up up the Nile, up river from the the fourth cataract is what. So that, what's a cataract? Okay, it's a big uh, waterfall, and so uh, Cush would have been in this area here, maybe. But then Cush is also another name, possibly for um, for Ethiopia. And then there's other writings that put Cush uh, over in. Saudi Arabia area, and so it's it's not totally one hundred percent set in stone where uh, who and what uh, Kush would be, but um, it you know basically it, the the tradition says that it's the uh, descendants of of um, Noah's son Ham. And uh, so anyway, the, this area, this is where they're talking about where Isaiah is, is talking about. And these guys, these Ethiopians, these the, the Kushites uh, were adept with their small boats that plied the, the um, Nile River. And that uh, when you see them in the distance, as it were, with their little, uh, with their um, their sails, and they used a, um, I think it was called a Latin sail, but um, very simple, simple uh, device that uh, said it, you know, looked like on that shimmering with the heat and the water and all that, it looked like uh, um, an insect with his uh, fluttering their their wings. So that's what they're talking about there, is where the land beyond the the uh, uh, rivers of uh, of Ethiopia. And in that same area down there was also a group of people called the Nubians. And these were fierce warriors also. They were tall. They were, uh, in Israel, they were referred to as the smooth-skinned ones. Uh, they didn't have these massive beards that uh, the other folks did. And, uh, but they were, they were extremely, um ferocious actually they they hired themselves out as as uh, mercenary armies and to in many cases so also this area of kush was a land noted for its insects and um i don't know i just um I think the people of that day would have understood where we're talking about, but this is this seems the the scholar's best guess is where we're talking about right here in uh, in Ethiopia, and uh, some people say, well, it's even further down than that because it was um, it was uh, like a shadow land where it's right on the equator where you know sometimes the sun was in the north of it and sometimes the sun was on the south side of it and so it had two shadows. Well, it doesn't have two shadows. You're, I've done a lot of work and lived on the equator. You don't have two shadows. But uh, <clears throat> the um, then there's a third interpretation as to where this was, what it was. And um, they they use the the idea of the ships as you know as kind of a pinpoint as to where these these things were. Because so the prophet may be intending to say that. Uh, the ships of the Ethiopians, they whiz up and down the rivers like winged insects. I, you know, when I think of that, I think of like the dragonflies that are always whirling around in, in the summertime on the rivers. And so um, um, it just shows that I think this, this supports the idea <clears throat> of um, 
supports the idea of uh, the Ethiopians as being ambassadors or emissaries. They're putting the word out. And some of the commentaries that I wrote, uh, that I was reading here said that, you know, it, it talked about Cush being, it's a judgment against Cush. I'm not real sure I see it that way. I think that they were more going to be the messengers to get the word out to everyone. And so there will come a call uh, to all the nations. And um, um, and another thing about Cush is that it was a metaphor for the Israelites, that that was the end of the world. I mean, the, the, that was on the edge of the earth, on the ends of the earth. That uh, you couldn't, you just couldn't get any further away than uh, than Cush, because that's as far as the world went, and beyond that is the old saying, "There be dragons." And so um, the the idea here is that um, that there's going to be a, a calling by God, and the the messages are going to go out to all the world, to the ends of the world. Everyone is going to be affected, and um, so. Um, the the um in in 715 715 bce there was a new dynasty uh began to rule in egypt and it was like the 25th dynasty or whatever and uh this uh this dynasty was uh nubian or kushite okay i mean the, the, about the same kind of a thing just a different name and so this ruling family may very well have sent envoys to Judah as well as to Philistia and Moab to try to um, ally themselves and go against uh, Sargon, the, the Assyrian. So, uh, you know, we, we just don't know what um, exactly how that was, what that referred to. Um, but they did go up and down the river. These folks did go up and down the river all of the, of the, of the Nile with boats that were pretty fast. And they were, you know, they would go up and down the rivers. They wouldn't go. Uh, I don't think you could put them to sea because they weren't built for that. But they were made out of papyrus reeds and then woven together and and uh, so forth. So um, the... Um, the Egyptians called the Nile the sea, um, just like some Arabs today will call that the Euphrates that. And uh, you know, shoot, even in in Israel, they call that little lake the the uh, um, you know Sea of Galilee. And uh, I think there's uh, there's counties in Texas that are bigger. Well, I know there's ranches in Texas that are bigger than the uh, Sea of Galilee, but they call it the Sea of Galilee. All right. So, uh, and we don't know, there's no really record of, of these guys going out and in, in, in their papyrus boats and, uh, you know, going to actually going to sea in the Mediterranean with it. But um, the word go there in, in the uh, scripture, it, it, uh, kind of gives them orders and a directive to be messengers so um i think that the, it wouldn't wouldn't make a whole lot of sense that uh god would tell them to go uh if they were going to these other countries to try to to develop an um an, an alliance to go against assyria i think this is more of a case of um, God is telling, okay, we're going to give a message to, to you. And, um, um, so this, this message, uh, it, it ends with where it says that you would, uh, let, let me pull it back up there. Um, when you, uh, when a banner is raised on the mountains, look, when a shofar is blown, listen. So what comes to mind with me? For that is the the idea of uh, the Shema, the the, found, the fundamentalist, the, the the foundational prayer of Israel is the Shema, and uh, that word Shema is it's okay. It's 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 a very complex meaning in that it says to listen, 
but it's also listen and obey, listen and do, listen and pay attention. Um, and so uh, here God is saying, okay, you are to listen up and uh, and pay attention because there's a paradigm shift coming here. And so uh, um, let's go ahead. We're almost out of, out of juice here. It says, for uh, Adonai said to me, I will remain quiet and look for my dwelling place like shimmering heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew and harvest heat. For before the harvest, as soon as blossoming is over and flower becomes ripening grape, he will cut off the shoots with pruning knives and he will cut back and remove the twigs. They will be left together for the mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the land. The birds of prey will summer on them and all the beasts of the land will winter upon them. At that time, tribute will be brought to Adonai Svaot from uh, a nation tall and smooth skinned from a people far, a feared far and wide, a nation powerful and oppressive whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of Adonai Svaot, Mount Zion. All right. So again, uh, <laughs> Isaiah has waxed poetic here at the, uh, at the end. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so, um, he shares the word which has come to him from, from God. It says, when this flag is raised um, and the trumpet sounds, you know, what, what mighty acts was God going to uh, perform? Well, it might be kind of disappointing because it says that uh, what God says, he's going to just stand up here and he's going to look from his throne. He's going to watch. And he's just going to do some more looking and watching and waiting. So people that are expecting for God to come immediately to the rescue and, and uh, you know, jump off the throne and, and uh, tear into things, uh, the Lord says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sit back here and I'm going to watch. And, uh, you know, God does not exist for i mean he, he he just doesn't work in that way in which people think that he should that that he's there at our beck and call you know there are preachers out there that tell you that uh, if you read the bible uh, you read god's word back to god and tell him that this is what the word of god says then he is honor bound and he cannot refuse you that you can get what you need and what you want because God's word said thus and thus and so. And uh, that's that's ridiculous because at that point, then you got God in a in a bottle and, you know, you're rubbing the bottle and pff, out comes the genie. And so that's that's ridiculous. You can't put God in the box. You can't dictate to God what he's going to do, what he's not going to do. And so um, but uh, these these guys are going to be. uh um um, yeah, Jonathan says, yeah, it's a, a false, a false faith. Yes, indeed. And so, um, the, uh, these messengers are going to come out and, and just bring the word of God. And finally, when he does stand up and in the, and I like, uh, look at this, you know, it talks about in the, the shimmering heat waves where, you know, things just don't happen real quickly. When it's hot and muggy and just, you know, just nobody feels like doing anything, God says, I'm just going to sit here and wait. I'll watch it. And you know what? God is always on time. He's never late. He's never early, but everything that he does is in time. And they talk about the, in these verses, the coming in and, and pruning and cutting and then the the uh, tendrils and the branches and the twigs that they cut off, laying on the ground. That uh, um, they're, if they're not bearing fruit, you know that God says He's going to wait until the tree or branch or vineyard, whatever, gets up there and starts producing fruit, so they can see. Aha! Uh -huh, you're producing fruit. You're producing fruit. Oh, you over there! You're not producing fruit. We're going to cut that one off. 
And uh, so that's that's why God is, you know, he's putting his knife and and those Assyrian tendrils are cut off. And again, that's a that's a kind of a uh, finger pointing at Sennacherib on uh, around Jerusalem. As an example, there are other examples out there, but uh, um, at the end of that night, instead of a conquering army against Jerusalem, there were 185,000 dead soldiers that were lying about that had to be disposed of and uh, buried. But before they could do that, the, the carrion eaters, the buzzards, the jackals, the hyenas, whatever, they, they had a field day and they uh, you know, ate up uh, a whole bunch of them. And so um, <clears throat> we see that um, at the end of the day, all this, when it occurs, the Cushites or the Nubians or whatever they're, um, that, that name, those people from down there, they will be subdued, even though they're meant, um, they are Emissaries now, later on in the chapter, we'll see where they were. There's a, there is um, a, an oracle against them. But at this point, they're, they are emissaries. But they will eventually be subdued, and they will where? They will come up to the throne of, of uh, Judah, or they will come to God's throne in the temple in Jerusalem. And there they will worship, and, and you'll see that in the in the millennial period where the nations of the world will come up. And a lot of this that we've seen that, you know, they're, they're talking about the few nations, but in reality, it's more than just a few nations. This is a, this is a, um, a story of a metaphor for all of the nations, all of the world uh, is like the Nubians or the Cushites, or the Ethiopians where, they were against God or they were doing what God, you know, just they're doing the work of God. But then at the end of the day, they will be subdued and they will be worshiping God. And uh, we'll see that in the millennial period where all of the nations of the world will be subdued. There will be no more wars for a thousand years. And uh, so that's when, you know, Messiah is going to reign for for uh, that thousand years from Jerusalem, and that's what they're talking about here. That this is this is another kind of a very subtle hint at the messianic era and at the time when the Messiah will come. All right, so um, that, that kind of concludes what I had uh, tonight. Um,